Welcome to Elite Team Talks, the podcast that simplifies the universal principles underpinning the world's most successful teams. I'm Henry Cheatham, founder of Elite Human Solutions. Join me as we venture into the minds of individuals who have created, led, researched, or been a part of history's most successful teams, from World Cup winning coaches to Special Forces leaders and the minds of Google. We're committed to presenting the most diverse array of thought leaders ever assembled. Through the stories and wisdom of our guests, we filter the noise, extract key insights, and deliver clear, actionable steps for you to build industry-leading teams and culture within your organization. Welcome to Elite Team Talks. Hi, and welcome, everyone. In today's episode, I welcome a former colleague and UK Special Forces Sergeant Major, Gary Gaz Bamford, to the podcast. During a career spanning more than two decades, Gaz led teams within one of the most elite Special Forces units in the world, the Special Boat Service, and later led the recruitment arm of UK Special Forces. Gaz is now the founder and CEO of Duratas, where he coaches senior leaders to be more authentic and resilient. Through the stories and wisdom gained, Gaz and I discuss the Special Forces approach to attracting and hiring the right people, where the stakes of one bad egg could be a matter of life or death. Gaz breaks down the misconceptions surrounding what the right person is and instead explains the crucial qualities you should be screening for to identify the best people to take your team to the next level. You can expect to understand how to identify the right people for your team and company, how to specifically attract these people, how to screen candidates for the most crucial qualities, how to build a team which take your company to the next level. As always, if you enjoy the episode and want to be the first to hear when new episodes drop, please like, rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. Most importantly, thank you as always for watching and listening. This podcast was created for you. And I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So our guest is Gaz Bamford. I'm very excited to speak to him. He's a highly experienced Special Forces leader. And he's actually got quite a unique perspective from his side of things. He'll obviously explain that in more detail. But having known Gaz previously where I worked, he had gone through the process of being obviously a Special Forces candidate and then a team member within the squadrons. He then actually led a squadron as a Sergeant Major and we'll discuss some of these challenges and uh, opportunities that he got through that. And then he actually had quite a unique perspective leading what's arguably world-renowned selection process for UK Special Forces. On top of that, as well as those different perspectives, he now applies the knowledge and wisdom that he learned to help business leaders become more resilient and more authentic through his company Duratas. So thank you very much for joining us today, Gaz. Pleasure to be here, Henry. Thanks for having me. Great. And would you like to introduce yourself? I've obviously given the 80-20, but I think it's always much better if you could explain who you are and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for the intro. Um, It's useful. Uh, I kind of, I live now where I was born and bred. I was born and brought up in the Midlands. Uh, so I couldn't live any further from the coast, but we'll come into this. I volunteered for a career in the Royal Marines by the coast, which then subsequently led to a career for 16 plus years uh, in in the SBS. Again, where I am now, literally, you, you can't get any further from the coast um, in this country. So it's slightly strange that I volunteered for that, but I, I've, I've definitely got some thinking on that. But I, uh, I now, and after my career, loved thoroughly enjoyed the kind of coaching and mentoring aspect of what I did towards the end, which we can scratch around. And for clarity, that was, I oversaw the recruitment and talent ID area. So we communicated with, we spoke to, we uh, recruited people in and got them to the start point. We prepared people somewhat for that kind of initial um, challenge and then got them to the very start of the selection process. I didn't oversee the selection process per se. Um, I then managed their careers if they were subsequently unsuccessful or or successful. I embedded them into the squadrons, et cetera, onboarded them, I should say. So that was the the last few years of my career. What I do now is I coach uh, senior leaders, executive business owners um, around leadership, 
being more resilient, being more authentic and helping them to um, help their teams be better ultimately um, from using my previous experiences. So, yeah, I do a lot of things now and a lot of things in a lot of pies and uh, very much loving life, but happy to scratch around any of that, but also Henry to dig back into some of the stuff that I, I used to do for sure. Awesome. And you mentioned the SBS there. For those who maybe don't know much about them, they're obviously more covert for good reason than the SAS. And I can quite honestly say when I rocked up for my interview, I was very honest and said, I have very little understanding of what you do. Um, but hopefully, if given the opportunity, I can understand that better and help solve some of the problems you're facing. Would you like to just give a little breakdown of the differences between the two maybe and whether that has any effect on selection? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, it, firstly, it's a great question, and I'll be being brutally honest. When I first took over the role in recruitment, you know, I had to think hard about what it was that really attracted me to the unit, as opposed to uh, the the sister unit, uh, the SAS, which which everybody in the Western world is familiar with, right? Um, every male, certainly. And you know, what was it that the SBS have? that is different well I, I can communicate that somewhat now um in essence they're very similar very very similar 95 percent commonality in many ways and exactly the same selection process it's joint and it's been joint for many many years uh numerous decades now uh way before my time uh when it when it became joint so i went through the joint selection process and and on the back of be, being successful at selection or not you then go to the your your, des, your desired unit um, so the, the, ma the major difference now is the fact that the SBS has got, uh, apart from being much, much tougher, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, they've got, they've got a diving capability ultimately. So they have also, uh, the ability to, to use various means of diving uh, underwater to get to where they need to go or conduct missions. That, that's the long and short of it. All the other patrol skills are shared. Various units have priority uh, over the training of them. If operations decided that um, necessitated certain uh, patrol skills, then each of the unit has uh, to varying degrees levels of skills in them to be able to, to conduct what they need to do normally to get from A to B before they then conduct the mission that needs to be done so it's uh it's 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 very very minor differences these days um i think the the SES, as numbers is concerned is ever so slightly larger but um apart from that there's very little difference these days certainly that's not how it was when i first joined but again we've transitioned through that that's certainly where it's at now hmm. i think one of the things i enjoyed the most was how both units referred to the other as their sister unit that was uh, that was one of the the obvious things from from day dot. Well, that, that's completely unconscious of me as well. But uh, <laughs> no, we talk a lot about competition and rivalry, and and I, I genuinely never saw them as rivals. You know, we, you you form good relationships with the guys that you go through selection with, and then throughout my career, did lots of joint periods with them, but then also. Um, watch them do various stuff and again got it you know did a lot of things ourselves I, I never saw them as competition but there's definitely a healthy rivalry um which we can unpick around people and purpose but um even in the recruitment role initially i was the i was the lead recruiter for the sbs towards the end of my time and my competition was the sas right the the, the people we were ultimately wanting in our organization would also very much want to join the SAS. And I understood that when I was a young guy and when I first joined the military, that's absolutely what I wanted to do. So, you know, I could understand that, but that competition was, you know, I think kept in a really healthy way and, and most of the time and um, really enabled us to, to drive each other on to, you know, um, we didn't think about those that much and they didn't think about us, I'm sure that much, but there was a time when, you know, having, you know, someone to compare yourself to uh, and, and 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 have that competitiveness against is can be useful. So, so yeah, uh, a number of things to discuss as, uh, as well there. But yeah, definitely the sister unit, big sister, no doubt. <laughs> One that you hug, exactly. <laughs> so in regards to the selection process, you know, if we're talking in the corporate space, companies hire Oxford and Cambridge graduates, not necessarily 
because of the teaching there, but because of the rigorous selection process necessary to get into these establishments. And I remember in one of my earliest days walking past a quote on the wall that said, select the right people and let them get on with it when I work with you guys. Um, and you've still got some of your hair, but I'm not sure it's quite as simple as just getting the right people in and letting them get on with it. But I'd like to start by discussing, as you've mentioned, the selection and recruitment process. What is that? And would you be happy sharing your story of going through what is often considered the most demanding and rigorous hiring process in the world for our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. So that that quote um, is from one of the SBS founders, Roger Courtney, um, who was one of the leaders at the time back during the Second World War. Uh, and and that they, they were his thoughts, you know, and... There's a lot of truth in it, you know, that, that the right person, what what NASA recruited for, the right stuff is that magic quality, right? And uh, that that there's various characteristics that are, are the same equally for each individual unit um, in whatever and, and, and workplace in whatever environment, there's going to be nuances there as well. You know, the right person for the SPS isn't necessarily... Uh, going to be the right person for NASA, let's say, but there's characteristics there that are identical. So with regards to selection, um, I think I, I'll talk about my experience, I think, Henry, and certainly I had, when I joined the Marines, I had no idea who the SPS were. Uh, I'd understood who the SAS were, and I'd read books uh, growing up on the SAS, uh, one in particular, uh, Bravo 2.0, and that sowed a seed inside me of, wow, that that thing exists. I didn't even know it existed before that. And I was like, wow, how on earth do I become that? I had no idea. Um, I knew it meant I had to join the military, and I volunteered for the military. And I volunteered for the Marines, as I alluded to, um, which there's definitely something in that which we can discuss but i volunteered for the marines i saw it as the a big crunchy challenge and then when it was my time in the marines that i started to hear about the sps and i start when very early on in my career i was exposed that sounds wrong i was exposed to some guys in the sps um who came onto our a norway training package that i was doing at the time and i got to meet the real people within that organization they'd been serving for some years but had never uh, been trained in uh, the Arctic conditions. So they did a bit of time with the Marines to learn those skills before they went off back to their unit with these necessary basic fundamentals. And so, uh, and I was exposed to them and I was like, wow, these guys are, you know, good dudes, very normal and uh, like a wide range of people. They didn't all look the same. My perceptions of what someone in special forces looks like was tall, muscly in my mind and just an uber athlete. And I was like, well, there was elements of that, but equally there was such variety amongst them. And a common thing that I saw amongst them was almost normalness, but humility. And these qualities, I was like, wow, that that isn't what I expected. And again, that sowed a seed. Again, as my career progressed in the Marines, again, become more and more known uh, or I knew more about them and then decided post 9-11, the Twin Towers attack to go, do you know what? I'm going to try for this organization myself because I... I Within that, I created a reason why I would be prepared to go and challenge myself at something so difficult, I expected to fail. That's the long and short of it. I absolutely expected to fail because I'd never heard of people be successful. I'd only ever heard the horror stories of people coming back with their tail between their legs from the selection process. And I thought, but this, this fire inside me of this, this abhorrent terrorist attack and also trying to measure myself against that high standard something that I've always tried to do was powerful enough for me to give it a go. Um, so I volunteered um, not long after the 9-11 attack. So that would have been a big, you know, end of night, um, 01, beginning of 02, onto their kind of, sele- onto the SBS's selection process before the, the joint selection process, kind of a briefing course before the main selection process. So beginning of 2003, and I and I and I passed that selection course. Uh, happy to break it down into big chunks. The first part is um, the hills phase, which again is is very well written about on the internet. Um, it was four weeks when I went through it. I'm not swinging the lantern. It's it's three weeks now. That doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean it's a week easier. You're trying to cram similar things and development and 
upskilling, I guess, into a short amount of time, some would argue. Uh, it, you know, it, it was four weeks though before, again, and then after that you fly to the jungle for six weeks. Um, again, an environment I'd never been to. Um, and, and then post jungle, there's there's what's called continuation training, which includes all kinds of skills, including parachuting, resistance, interrogation, combat survival, um, counterterrorism training. So all kinds of other courses. Certainly in my day, it was when you passed the jungle, it was deemed you had a huge, huge chance of being successful on the six month selection process. If you came back for the jungle with a, yep, you're doing good, you can stay on the course. Um, I know that was not the message we got at the time, but that was certainly the perception I had. And the vast majority of guys, bar an injury, that came back from the jungle did end up being successful. Um, having been the recruitment sergeant major later on in my career, I know that's not the case. And I know there's people been unsuccessful on various phases of the course uh, on continuation training um, after the jungle. So, yeah, all kinds of things to discuss there. Um, so is any of that that you want to scratch around some deeper a bit deeper henry yeah i think what you mentioned there that really piqued my interest was your why for mm. just even signing up to the royal marines in the first place and you know when i spoke with sf candidates or even those at the unit the operators that have been successful there were some really common things that tended to be pulling factors like the community the values the experiences that are afforded but I guess even before you start looking at individuals that are at your door saying they want to be a part of the special forces, how did you go about attracting people who were aligned with what you saw as maybe the mission or the vision or the values, the type of individuals you want? You know, the um, the All Blacks quote, and I say quote unquote here, and they're no dickheads policy reminds me somewhat of the approach that's taken from like a character-based hiring process with selection but how do you attract the right people in the first place rather than yeah. just weeding out those who maybe didn't align with with what you were about yeah again i'll, I'll talk about my experiences so various things attracted me to the royal marines initially and what I know now, and I can I can communicate a bit more succinctly than I would have been able to at the time, but I, I thought I would love to be a part of that. I would genuinely love to be a part of that organization because they look pretty cool and they're doing things, adventurous things, exciting things that I would love to, to do with my life. You know, when I was 18 years old after college, I wasn't I wasn't looking for certainty. I was looking for adventure, excitement, and the unknown. And and the Marines seemed to offer that in spades. So I volunteered for that. Now that's also quite unusual, I've come to know, that there's other probably more easier options to get excitement and adventure. And, you know, I, I, like I said, I live in the Midlands. The closest regiment to me at the time, I think they're still around, they might be part of Rifles now, is um, the Staffordshire Regiment. And it would have been easy for me to volunteer, easier for me to volunteer for the Staffordshire Regiment. That's no slant on the Staffordshire Regiment, but basic army training is easier than... Uh, Royal Marines commando training and you know that, that's the longest training basic training in the world and so to volunteer the very decision to volunteer for something that is the longest and hardest like uh, that's different now again that is a quality though well why would someone want to volunteer for something that is higher and harder because they're looking to uh maximize their potential i guess or realize their potential someone's willing to fail but and struggle to do something if they're successful that's that's a that's a quite a rare quality and so as as when i was in recruitment and we were trying to attract the right people we would go and fish for people where the right fish were right so we knew that the right qualities of people were sat in the royal marines were sat in the parachute regiment were sat in various other regiments of the military that that you know the recce troops of the world that people have started the journey of becoming you know their best self in that world but then chosen to do courses that would further themselves rather than sit and just be comfortable in the position where they're at right and and that's not to say those people don't have the potential they're just in an environment where it's maybe not encouraged to be really furthering yourself but i was certainly early on in my career 
encouraged to try and maximize my potential and and that is a part of me also so those those stars aligned and the people that are trying to maximize their potential end up in organizations that are with it, certainly with regards to the military and groups within the military that are doing the more exciting things so again people may or may not know that with the marines there's all kinds of specializations i just wanted to soldier that's all i wanted to do because i saw that would give me the variety so again i ended up trying working hard communicating to my hierarchy i just want to soldier that affording me opportunities to go into this recce troop again so i spent some time in recce troop before i went on to selection and and, and i was always looking to take these small steps to keep improving and that continued whilst i was in special forces it doesn't stop it's just kind of part of my makeup so the, the ethos of special forces is this unrelenting pursuit of excellence. Now, we, we try to impress that into the people that we, we bring in, we on board, but equally there's elements of that character already in them. We just give them the vehicle to, to realize that in many ways. So the people that are, you know, if, if people are listening to this and they're sat in the military and they're thinking, I'd love to be special forces. Well, the first step is to volunteer for the course, right? You know, it's not, I'm not there to try and sell to people that this is a good or was to sell to people that that was a good career opportunity. There's, you know, something about the person has to be driving them to want to know more about themselves. You know, Socrates, you know, famously quoted, you know, know thyself, you know, get feedback, hold yourself accountable to high and hard standards, you know, and then learn that being prepared to, and it's hard to get feedback and to go, you're not quite good enough at this, but be prepared to receive that and to, to then go and ask yourself the question, why, or what can I do to make myself better? That's the sort of person that we were looking for. And we found those kind of people in high performing teams because they'd volunteered and had the um, skills and, and environment often to enable them to thrive in those organizations. And sometimes they would be very in, in, um, depend, um, independent and volunteer themselves. Sometimes people needed a bit of a nudge to say, and this is exactly how I do it sometimes, I would point to people, talk to people and say, build relationships with people and say, you're more qualified than I was when I was in your position. You're more experienced. You've got more years under your belt in this world bef before you're thinking of on if this is genuinely something you want to do then trust me just go and see and sometimes that's the nudge you know whether that's mentorship whether that's coaching you know it's just authenticity it's honesty of uh, and this is what we realized got us quite a lot of success in our recruitment by just being open and honest rather than selling this sexy dream that wasn't real you know just be real and not this is the honesty this is what we the kind of things we get to do but it means that you've got to do a b c d x y and z to get there but if you're prepared to do that we'll help you on that journey and so i've said a lot there ultimately the the people that we were looking for were in teams were in organizations that already were doing crunchy things because the kind the right kind of person was volunteering for those kind of things so but if you if you're famous if you're um familiar with the famous shackleton advert in the newspaper that he put for people that were volunteering for uh, his en endeavor expedition it was you know I, I remember it almost as being you know men wanted you know they're not going to pay much there's a lot of danger involved in that um and, as, and you know you're not guaranteed a safe return but you will get honor when you come back there will be recognition of the success that you've achieved and for some people that intrinsic re reward is all they're looking for it's not about external plaudits and again let me let me finish on this with regards to that no one ever joins the sbs to tell people they're in the sbs because you know as a man that lives on the south coast you knew nothing about the sbs when you were going for the job that's not the same for people volunteering, at least for the SAS. There's lots of people that volunteer to join the SAS to tell people that they volunteered to be in the SAS. They're, they're, those people typically aren't successful. Again, and we can talk about the, the, the successful motivations there. But um, again, the people that find themselves in the SBS typically certainly used to be the case that they weren't in the organization to tell people in the SBS because no one knew what it was and no one cared, for, quite frankly. And that's okay <laughs> for people in the SBS. Absolutely. No, that's fascinating. There's obviously a huge amount of emphasis from what you said there that's placed on character and values, potentially over skill. 
What are your views on that? And what advice would you give companies that are wanting to develop high performing teams in regards to their hiring process and finding a balance between character and values of the individual and the skill? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's one that I've thought about and spoke about a number of times. The thing that separates the military, I've come to realize, is that we have to spend lots of time together, you know, often deployed for months at a time, just with a small team. So how well you fit together, how well aligned you are, how much you like, and most importantly, trust one another is critical. It's critical for your life in some occasions. So selecting people that are somewhat like-minded but offer diversity to the team in different ways is important. Now, what skills they bring with the diversity is also important. You know, we've got to be self-supporting, but like character by far and away is more important. So going back to the selection process, the Hills process, we used to call it shaking the lemon tree, you know, so you shake the lemon tree and the lemons fall out. So we sweep the lemons away and then you've got the strong lemons that are still hanging on in the tree. They're the people we take to the jungle, right? So the, 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 the Hills process is a, f- a, a physical test. Yes. It also a mental test, um, a, a heavy mental test on whether people have the grit, determination, resolve to stay the course. You don't have to be a physical specimen by any stretch to be successful on the hills. Um, We can talk about that a little bit, but you do have to be determined. You have to be clear in why you're doing it. You have to be driven. You have to be really gritty. um, And you can suffer with the best of them. Is that stubbornness somewhat, but you've just got to be able to survive and hang on. And that's a certain characteristic. That's what we're testing for on the hills, not necessarily physical um, strength and prime, um, prime fitness. Then you go to the jungle and the jungle is all about testing for character. That's exactly what we did. So what the military and special forces have is six weeks where they really get to scrutinize someone's character. Now, this is where with corporate world, it differs because we have time on our hands there to really scrutinize people's character. And I understand now clearly that in in most corporate settings, it would be unreasonable to ask people to give six weeks of their time to the selection process to be told, yeah, this job's not for you because you're not a fit, good fit character wise. However, this, I'm just being honest with how we do it um, or we did it in in special forces world. And that was critical. And the, the main difference, and I, I talk about this with sport as well, um, with a number of uh, uh, elite football teams, because they've asked similar questions and we've had similar conversations. When, when you're working with someone Monday to Friday, let's say four or five days a week for eight to, eight, eight to 10 hours a day, let's say, then their character flaws can be put up with somewhat if they're incredibly skilled and talented at what they do. That's, harder to swallow when you're living with them day in, day out for 24 hours at a time, trusting them with your life on the other side of the planet remotely. You know, that that's from any support. That's that's a different beast. And so we, we needed to select for character. And actually, if people weren't a good character fit, it was much a much simpler decision to say, you know, you're not the right person. Uh, you, you know, this isn't going to work. And Even there was a, as you may or may not be aware, Henry, there was a probation period for quite a long time. We're going to too much detail, but quite a long time after you were successful, once you were in the squadrons, they called it badged in the squadrons, where you were still under probation. And and if it was decided through various different performance kind of reviews, you could be released because it turns out we got it wrong. Even after six months, we got it wrong. And of, of selection, you're not a good, you're not a good fit, and so they'd get moved on. So, because character and how much or how well you integrate with the team was so vitally important. Now, that's not to say that everybody was a perfect fit. That's just to say that people are the edges can get they can get molded enough into that organisation to to fit in and to find their place, their role, and to be able to bring on the organisation and to uplift the organisation. Now. 
Um, there's lots of people that kind of were challenging. I don't think I was necessarily one of them, but I say with humility, I'm sure there's lots of people that didn't particularly uh, gravitate towards me. That's fine, you know, but but equally I added enough to the service to kind of uh, d- develop it in, in this, in the time that I, uh, in the time that I work with them. So ultimately characters so much not more important, but it was, it was vitally important for our success way over and above skills can be taught how good a shot you are, how fit you are. That's a, that's a performance, um, improvement scale. You know, we can improve all of those things. What your character is like so much harder to mold people when it comes to hardwired character traits, not to say it's impossible. The environment does have an influence, but it's, it's, it's much more difficult to manage. So yeah, we, we, with regards to how, the how we selected for that, certainly in the jungle process, we trusted one another. So the, the directing staff were very carefully selected, more often than not. And um, they, they were experienced people that understood what good looked like, what good felt like, what good kind of... Um, we had all kinds of performance reviews and metrics that we would assess on objectively but we also really valued sitting in a circle as directing staff to go, what do we think of smudger, let's say, and and everyone would have an open, honest opinion of what they've seen. If they've not seen them, but no comment, but if they've seen them, their opinion and what their subjective feelings about that person was. And that, that group think, I know group think is often challenged, but equally, that group think was incredibly important to, to find subjective um, feelings about individuals and character traits. So it's not easy. And this is why we had the probation period afterwards, no doubt, that there's, there's, there's room still for um, error. But ultimately, you've got to find a way. It is difficult to understand because people can hide and people can be the great man. And we would try and bring that out of people. But ultimately... Um, uh, we needed to select for character because they just had to fit in. Mm, yeah, it, it's fascinating. I remember because my role was primarily in the physical space, I was asked quite often, did I think selection matched the physical demands of the job? And, you know, I'm denied about it for a while. And after a good amount of time, I realized it's not about that. They just use physical fatigue to manifest a psychological stress to peel back all those layers that we want to portray ourselves as to the wider world. And from an outsider's perspective, that was the genius of selection to really on another level understand deeply who that person was, how they functioned when they were so sleep deprived, so physically exhausted, and they'd been doing this for months, not weeks or days. Um, So it makes total sense, like you say, that you can't necessarily replicate that in a corporate space. One of the things that I would like to understand is in regards to experience, you've come up with some nice phrases like you can't cheat experience and experience is experiences times a thousand. But you also emphasize that selection identifies individuals with the potential to be great, not necessarily those who already possessed experience. So what advice would you give to teams, whether it's in a corporate space or elsewhere, to spot candidates with the potential for greatness before they've proven it, maybe in other organizations? Yep. So it's a good question again. Um, I would say challenge people to do hard things. So ultimately, when you distill down what the selection process was, as you so well described there from an, from your external point of view to the process, um, we challenged people and then we exposed them to themselves as well. It wasn't just about them peeling back the layers so we could see them. It was about exposing them to themselves. And the vast majority of people are through the selection process withdraw themselves actually they go do you know what this isn't for me for various reasons so they they expose themselves and they go this isn't this isn't for me i'm for whatever reason i'm going to take myself off and that's fine they've realized it isn't for them and that, that it isn't for most people that's the reality and so i, I would say to corporations or organizations that are looking to in, uh, recruit 
super talented and people that have incredible potential is 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 to challenge them to do something difficult and then see how that trans that that, that the the output that what happens or what transpires because people that are willing to do very difficult things are people that can are seeking feedback in many ways they're looking for feedback they're holding self accountable they become uh, to under, they come to understand their their flaws they they then get the information they need to try and improve on those things so by setting a high bar a high standard you know and as leaders we have to live by that standard it's not an unachievable standard it's a standard that we can all achieve but is difficult it's it's, it's challenging um you know putting that out there and and, and seeing who walks towards that problem you know i, I say this i've worked with the 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 ambulance services, I've worked with the, the fire service and police, you know, when there's a problem and some people walk towards that problem, that is a, that is an, un- that is not normal, hmm. you know, especially when the problem's really big and challenging and dangerous, maybe even the person that walks towards that challenge and goes, yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can help. That isn't a normal decision for most people. Most people turn away from the problem because it's more easy to do that. And I understand that. And but the person that's willing to be, take the problem square on and go, I'm happy to see how I do. And I don't know if I can be of help here, but I'm willing to try. That's that's the mindset we're looking for. It's the sheepdog mentality of being the protector almost of going, well, I, I, I think you know, a sheepdog isn't as as capable as a wolf but a sheepdog will protect the sheep but also be feared by the sheep it's that that's the kind of separation in this and, and the, the, the sheepdog mindset isn't 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 typical of people uh I, I would love when i was in my former role of going out to try and recruit people in special forces that i had all these characteristics that i could share with people sprinkle some magic dust on people and say hey this is this is what you need to be in this organization but it's the, the reality is it's most people don't want that level of accountability. They don't want that challenge. They want a little bit more of a comfortable life. And that's fine because the the, the challenges to having a career in that old world and for any high-performing organization, the, the compromises that people have to make to have success in those challenging environments are great. And that isn't for everyone. That isn't for everyone with their health. It's not for everyone with their families. It's not uh, for everyone with regards to the, the the style of life they they choose to live and the things that they want. Um, and and that's what that's the reality of the situation. Uh, certainly, as I've found it, so organisations should I think should sit and understand what their standards are. They, they they set a high standards and hold people accountable to a high standard and see who volunteers for that and who walks towards it because um, people again this is my experience with special forces nobody joined special forces to try and change special forces i hear it so often now that especially in elite sport where individuals come to teams to to be about them like no one ever ever in the history of special forces that was success, successful at least had had that they they wanted to be a part of that organization for what it was trying to do as an organization and to achieve versus making it about them so set high standards, do hard things and, and see who comes on that journey and volunteers with you. I think that's something that organizations can give some more consideration to. Mm, no, fantastic. The authenticity that you speak about there in regards to communicating how challenging it might be is a new idea to me in that you don't often see on job descriptions, this is going to be really hard there's a real risk that it might absolutely burn you out. There's X and Y that you'll have to compromise on. But if you're willing to, we will afford you one of the greatest experiences of your life. And rather than sugarcoating it in, you know, what people want to hear, giving them a, a dose of honesty and authenticity and then seeing who comes. And yeah, it, it's oh, obviously yeah. going to attract a different individual. You, uh, you you touched on one of the sales pitches that I used to to give to people. You know, I used to say, "We we will give you experiences that billionaires can't pay to have." That that's the sale. 
to get those experiences, you need to prove yourself to be the right person, the right character, the right level of skills that we need. It's not incredibly high that it's unachievable. It's very doable if you just simply do these things and put yourself forward is one of those things. But the experiences that you'll get out the back end of that are experiences that billionaires can't pay to do. And that's that's one of the differences and that's one of the nuances to the people that go actually this is this is what i'm seeking it's not it's not for the money because there's no money in it it's not necessarily for the the the, the fame afterwards because nobody's going to hear about it and that's fine too um so yeah nice no, it's it's interesting, isn't it? And how you can apply it in a setting with a different set of constraints is is a big challenge. But there's obviously some real key pillars there. You know, hiring for attitude and training for skill, as I think Steve Jobs used to say. And they used to sit potential candidates in front of uh, an iMac prototype and see if their eyes lit up like a kid at Christmas. And it's almost what you're describing in regards to special forces selection make it not unattractive but so hard in a lot of ways um that you understand well who's actually aligned with what is going to be involved and what it takes absolutely that is that is that's how i see it henry for sure hi everyone so i hope you enjoyed the episode there were so many insights that i've decided to distill them down into eight takeaways I'll present each of these before we condense them down into three action points that you can apply straight away using the 5P framework. Takeaway one, create a culture and experience people want to be a part of. What attracted Gaz was the integrity and character of the SBS operators he met and the experiences it would afford him having just witnessed the Twin Towers attack alongside the opportunity to measure himself against the best in the world. The second takeaway, is identify the values and character of who you want on your team. The right person is context dependent, as Gad explained, and should be values and character driven if they're going to work in a team, which almost everyone is. Gaz and I discussed the notion of Roger Courtney's quote, who is one of the founding members of the SBS, which was select the right person and let them get on with it. And although this isn't quite as simple as it sounds, It explains how much emphasis should be placed on finding the right individual with the right values and character for your team. Takeaway three, identify environments, groups or organisations where these individuals will already be. To attract the right kind of people, Gaz and his recruitment team would go and fish where they knew the right people were, which in their instance was the Royal Marines due to their culture and the type of individual they attracted compared to other regiments. Where are you currently looking? Do these groups or organisations live and breathe the values that you desire? These are all important questions to ask. Takeaway four, don't sell a sexy dream. Present the honest, authentic facts and leverage the power of storytelling, with Gaz giving us the example of the Shackleton newspaper article that explained just how hard it would be on that trip. Gaz spoke about the power of storytelling and how actually the book Bravo 2-0 was what ignited his desire to apply for the Marines in the first place. From a corporate standpoint, with brand trust at an all-time low currently, authentically communicating the pros and cons of the offer to candidates is crucially important to firstly create trust and secondly, attract people who are actually aligned with your values and mission. The fifth takeaway was then to see who steps up to the plate. Gaz didn't sell. He presented a unique value proposition which not even billionaires could buy in his words and he saw who this aligned with. Takeaway six, challenge people to their limits in role specific scenarios in order to understand their habits and therefore their core values. Our values underpin our habits and science shows we automatically revert back to habits when under pressure and stress, which is why you can't reveal this within a formal interview. The lengths that UK Special Forces go to in order to identify the right people takes six months. And Gaz said that in most corporate settings, this is totally unreasonable, which I'd agree with. But by applying the same principles, such as layering stress and pressure, 
in job specific scenarios to reveal someone's habits and core values, you can achieve a similar result in a much shorter time period. And remember, your actions, not your words, define you and your values. Takeaway seven, select for character and values first and skills second. The more your company requires people to work together to achieve an ambitious goal, the more important character and values are over technical skills. Skills can be taught, but values and character are so much harder to mould. From the New Zealand All Blacks no dickhead policy to Warren Buffett's integrity, energy and intelligence triad, the world's most successful organisations prioritise character or integrity before entertaining skills or experience. Or, as the late Steve Jobs put it, hire for attitude and train for skill. The final takeaway from my discussion with Gaz was to leverage healthy competition as a means of raising performance and maintaining high standards which continue to attract the right people. In his environment, this was achieved through the ongoing rivalry between the SBS and SAS as the best special forces unit in the world and lived out every day through their motto, which was the unrelenting pursuit of excellence. So below are action points for the three P's most discussed today. Purpose, people and process. In regards to purpose, the first action point is to clearly define your origin story, vision, mission and values for your team or company. AKA who you are, the world you'd like to see, what you're going to do to achieve this and how you want to go about doing it. To attract those aligned with it, you then need to authentically communicate this and your offer through the power of storytelling. People, identify the values and behaviours that you want on your team and then hire people who display these under difficult job specific conditions, which can be achieved through your interview and screening process. In regards to process, don't go fishing if you can go to the fishmongers. What this means is that if there are organisations whose values strongly align with yours, look at the fish they've already caught for potential candidates. Alongside this, set minimum skill thresholds when hiring and then prioritise job-specific values-based hiring to ensure you have the right team member first and foremost. So as always, nothing was ever achieved without action. And I encourage you to discuss these insights and action points within your team. Together, you can develop creative ways of attracting and hiring the right people who take your team or company to the next level. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to be the first to hear when new episodes drop, please like, rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. In the next episode, Gaz shares his wisdom on how to create a resilient, high-trust culture within your organisation. He breaks down the crucial components underpinning this, the different constraints of military and corporate environments and intelligent ways of overcoming these. He also shares what it takes to lead a resilient, high-trust team and how to overcome the common challenges you're likely to experience as a leader. Last but not least, Gaz breaks down the myth that companies can't develop a level of connection, trust and belonging on par with special forces teams despite a lack of life or death scenarios and far less time together. He believes it's possible. You can expect to understand how to lead resilient high trust teams, how to healthily maintain high standards, how to effectively manage and benefit from conflict and how to develop a level of connection, trust and belonging on par with special forces teams. Thanks as always to you, our viewers and listeners for watching today's episode and for your support. If you haven't already, please like, rate, subscribe and share the podcast. Most of all, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Gaz and I'm looking forward to seeing you very soon for part two.